This is question one from the FRQ portion of the 2024 AP Bio exam. It's very important that you go to the College Board's website and download their version of this exam. It's very important that you see what the College Board does in terms of their presentation of information. So please do that now. To help you study, I've put together a checklist of all of the content of AP Bio. It'll help you prepare for that next test or for the AP Bio exam. You can download it at apbiosuccess.com slash checklist. Question one starts with this introductory text. Crossing over in meiosis one is required for homologous chromosomes to properly align during metaphase and segregate during the first cell division. And then you're asked to describe the function of S phase of interphase. What I suggest is that you pause the video write out that answer, and then continue to see my answer. The answer is that the function of the S phase is to replicate the cell's DNA or chromosomes. And for a little bit of background, and the reason why I'm giving you this background is because you won't be asked on a future FRQ the function of the S phase of interphase, but you might be asked other things about the cell cycle, so this is a great opportunity to review. The cell cycle consists of interphase and M phase. Interphase is everything that's in orange here around the entire circle. M phase is this area labeled M in yellow. Interphase itself has three subphases. Those are G1. G1 is generalized growth, including preparation for DNA replication. You just answered about S phase, which is replication of the chromosomes, replication of the DNA. And then there's G2, which is growth in preparation for cell division. M phase can be similarly subdivided. There's mitosis, and then there's cytokinesis. Mitosis is the division of the nucleus, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Note that there is a G0 phase that many specialized cells, nerve cells, muscle cells, enter into when they leave the cell cycle specialized and don't further divide. Question 1A part 2 has all of this introductory text. You can read it on your downloaded copy of the FRQ or you can listen along and read with me. Some regions of a chromosome called hotspots display a higher frequency of crossing over than other regions do. Crossing over is suppressed in chromosomal regions near the centromeres. The centromere region of a duplicated chromosome includes a collection of proteins that form a structure called the kinetochore. Scientists hypothesized that one or more of these kinetochore proteins are responsible for suppressing crossing over around the centromere. For background, here's the structure of a condensed and already duplicated chromosome. This is the kind of thing that you'd see at the beginning of prophase one of meiosis, or for that matter, prophase of mitosis. It would be the same. What you have is two sister chromatids making up the entire chromosome. And these are identical pieces of DNA, and the DNA was replicated during the S phase. There's a kinetochore. Those are protein handles. Those are shown at two. And those are handles that the spindle fibers, those fibers that pull the sister chromatids apart, grab onto, and the two sister chromatids are held together by a region of the chromosome, a region of DNA, that's referred to as the centromere. Here's more introductory text that's part of question 1a, part 2. To investigate their hypothesis, scientists modified chromosome 8 in yeast such that in each cell, one chromosome from the pair of homologous chromosome 8s contained the gene encoding red fluorescent protein, RFP, while the other chromosome from the pair contained the gene encoding green fluorescent protein, GFP. Cells expressing RFP emit or give off red light, and cells expressing GFP emit green light. Models of the modified chromosome 8 before and after crossing over are shown in figure one. This is my redrawn version of the College Board's black and white diagram. Here's before crossing over. There's two RFP genes on each one of the sister chromatids. And on this other chromosome, there is two version, or there are two versions of the GFP gene. And then you'll notice that the position of these markers is different after crossing over. Your job is to explain why some haploid cells formed after meiosis in this experiment will only have one fluorescent marker. Go ahead, give that a try, and then you can hear 
my explanation. Because crossing over is so essential to understanding this question, I want to talk about it in a bit more detail. We start with the homologous pairs pairing up, forming these units called tetrads. So there are two tetrads in this diagram. In each homologous pair, you have one, two, three, four sister chromatids, four sister chromatids. That's why it's called a tetrad. In each tetrad, there's an area that's called a chiasma, and that's a crossing over point. You can see that a little bit more clearly in this diagram. Here's the chiasma, and you can see the crossing over between this chromosome that's represented as red over here and this chromosome that's represented as blue over here. What is the crossing over all about? This region of this blue chromosome will be attached to the rest of this red chromosome and this region of this red chromosome will be attached to this blue chromosome. So by the time we're done, what we have are no longer chromosomes that come from your mom or your dad, but we have recombinant chromosomes that have DNA that's a mixture of DNA that you inherited from your mother and your father. With that background in place, we can now approach answering this question. And to help you do that, I've created a different version of this diagram that shows what happens in between before crossing over and after crossing over. Here's this chromosome that I've represented as blue with the two RFP genes on each sister chromatid. Here's this chromosome that I've represented as red with the two GFP genes. Over here, they're going to form a tetrad and this will be the chiasm and what will happen is they'll be crossing over. And follow closely what's going to happen. This portion of this chromosome that I've colored in blue, which has the RFP gene, is going to swap over to this portion of this chromatid that I've colored in red. The result will be what we see over here. We've got this GFP marker over here, and we've got this RFP marker over here. What will happen with this side? Well, here's this chromosome that I've represented as being blue in color, and here's this chromosome that I've represented as being red. This section will cross over to this portion of this other chromatid that I've colored in in blue. And what's the result? Well, there was crossing over, but now there's no markers because there was no marker over here and this portion which has no markers will now be transferred onto it. So this is why we have this situation after crossing over. This chromatid had no crossing over. This chromatid did but there's no markers. This chromatid had crossing over and there are now two markers and on this chromatid there was no crossing over. And now the grand finale, we have to connect what I just explained to the events of meiosis. After cytokinesis 1, we're going to put this mostly blue chromosome because it has some red after crossing over up on the top daughter cell. We're going to move this mostly red chromosome to the bottom daughter cell. That's cytokinesis 1. We've gone from diploid to haploid, but each chromosome is still doubled, consisting of two sister chromatids. This is going to go over here, carrying its one green marker. This is going to go over here, carrying its green marker and its red marker. This chromatid which has no markers whatsoever, is going over here into what I've designated as C. And this chromatid over here is going to go down to daughter cell D. What's our answer? Because some daughter cells will receive a chromosome that did not undergo crossing over slash recombination. That's why some haploid cells formed after meiosis in, the, in this experiment will only have one fluorescent marker. We finally gotten there. Fantastic. If you want to crush it on this year's AP Bio exam, then you're going to have to write great responses on the FRQ portion of the exam. It's half of your score. Where can you learn how to do that? On learn-biology.com with our enhanced practice FRQs. You read a prompt, you type in your response, 
We give you feedback telling you about your answer's strengths and weaknesses. If you need help, you can ask for a hint. If you're really stuck, you can study a sample answer. We have dozens of practice FRQs, and this is the kind of practice and feedback that'll lead you to crush it on this year's AP Bio exam. So here's your plan. Go to learn-biology.com, sign up, use our enhanced practice FRQs to get the practice you need to succeed. Question one, Part B. The scientists then investigated whether attaching individual kinetochore proteins to a specific DNA sequence present in a known crossing over hotspot on chromosome 8 affected the frequency of crossing over at this location. In their first experiment, they examined three groups of yeast cells containing the modified chromosome 8. Group 1 contained no kinetochore proteins attached to the hotspot. Group 2 contained the kinetochore protein CTF attached to the hotspot. And Group 3 contained the kinetochore protein IML attached to the hotspot. For each group, the scientists determined the frequency of crossing over between the RFP and GFP genes. To determine the frequency, the scientists added the number of cells emitting both red and green light to the number of cells that emitted no light and divided that by the total number of cells that's shown down here in figure two in this bar graph. Here's the first question of question one, part B. Identify the control group for the scientist's first experiment shown in figure two. The answer is that the control group is group one. A little bit of review. A control group is a group in an experiment that does not receive the independent variable. And the independent variables here, the things that are being tested, are the different kinetochore proteins, CTF and IML. So therefore, the control group is going to be the group that has no added kinetochore proteins, hence group 1. Question 1b, part 2. In a follow-up experiment, the scientists created a modified version of CTF in which the DNA binding portion had been removed. They compare the frequency of crossing over in yeast cells in the presence and absence of unmodified CTF with that in yeast cells in the presence and absence of the modified CTF protein, and the data are not shown. In the follow-up experiment, justify why the scientists used a modified CTF protein that is unable to bind to DNA as a control. See if you can figure that out. I'll show you the answer. Here's the answer. The modified CTF enabled the scientists to determine whether DNA binding of the CTF kinetochore protein inhibits crossing over. And here's a little bit of background explanation. This wasn't required by the college board, but this will help you understand it. From the question, you know that the scientists are investigating whether the binding of kinetochore proteins affects the frequency of recombination at the hotspot. So therefore, by using a version of the protein that can't bind to DNA allows the scientists to isolate the effect of CTF binding on recombination frequency. Question 1b, part 3. Identify the independent variable in the follow-up experiment. Go ahead and do that and then see my answer. The answer is the independent variable is the presence or absence of the modified CTF protein. Here's some background, some explanation. The independent variable in an experiment is the thing that you're testing. The scientists are comparing the frequency of crossing over in, and I'm quoting from the question, the presence and absence of unmodified CTF with that in yeast cells in the presence and absence of the modified CTF. In this case, and in most cases, what you're comparing is what you're testing. So that's why the independent variable is the presence or absence of the modified CTF protein. Are you asking yourself, how am I going to get a 4 or a 5 on the AP Bio exam? It's a good question because it's a hard test. But we have a plan for your success. Go to learn-biology.com and complete our interactive tutorials and interactive AP Bio exam reviews. We guarantee you a 4 or a 5 on the AP Bio exam. See you on learn-biology.com. Question 1C. 
based on figure two, describe the effect on the frequency of crossing over when CTF is attached to chromosome eight hotspot compared with the effect when IML is attached to the hotspot. This is a graph reading question. See if you can figure out the answer and then see my answer. The frequency when CTF is attached over here is less than when IML is attached. And the key to understanding this question is to look at the error bars. And notice that these error bars do not overlap, which means that the difference is statistically significant. This is a thing that will happen to you in AP bio exams all the time. If the error bars don't ever overlap, significant difference. If they do, the difference is insignificant. And you can't actually say that there's a difference between data set A and data set B if the error bars are like this. Question one, part D, questions one and two. We're going to combine those together. Predict the effect on the number of copies of chromosome eight that are likely to be present in the resulting daughter cells when CTF is attached to the hotspot. Provide reasoning to justify your prediction. Go ahead and do it and then see my answer. The prediction is that there will be one less or one extra chromosome in the daughter cells. Here's why. CTF, as you can see over here, it lowers the frequency of crossing over. But it doesn't affect the frequency of synapsis, of tetrad formation, which we see down here. And that means that tetrads will form, but they will not be separated. And the result will be non-disjunction leading to daughter cells that are n plus one, which means that they're the haploid number plus one or n minus one, the haploid number minus one. To understand that, let's take a closer look at non-disjunction. Here's normal meiotic division, where the homologous pairs pair up and then they separate and then they head to the daughter cells. In non-disjunction, what happens is that the homologous pairs fail to separate they both wind up getting dragged over to one side of the cell. As a result, if this happens during meiosis one, when we're talking about the separation of homologous pairs, then some of the daughter cells will have an extra chromosome. You can see that what we're expecting is for the haploid number to be two. But in this case, because we dragged over an entire extra homologous chromosome, then we have one, two, three, in one daughter cell, one, two, three, in the other daughter cell. And on this side, because we're missing that homologous pair, we only have one. So we have N plus one in half of the daughter cells, N minus one in the other half of the daughter cells. And to connect this to the question, if this chromosome over here were chromosome eight, then you'll see that half the daughter cells will have an extra copy of chromosome eight and half of the daughter cells will not have any copies of chromosome eight at all. Explain how the presence of hotspots shown in figure one could increase the likelihood that a population will survive in the presence of selective pressures. Give it a try and see my answer. Hotspots increase the frequency of crossing over that increases the frequency of recombination. And because recombination increases variation, the presence of hotspots will make a population more variable and better able to adapt to environmental challenges. Variation is the raw material for natural selection and natural selection is gonna work better in a population that has more variation. Here's a pro learning tip. Give yourself a day or two away from question one and then come back to it and write out your answers again. Check them against the scoring guide. This process of becoming a good FRQ writer is like building any skill and you have to practice it with repetition, but it'll work better with the way that memory works if you let yourself forget just a little bit and then come back to it in a couple of days and try and redo these questions. Speaking of practice making perfect, don't forget to go to learn-biology.com where we have dozens and dozens of enhanced FRQs that you can practice on and you'll actually get the feedback that you need that will get you to the highest level of FRQ competency. Go ahead, do it, don't wait. Go to learn-biology.com and watch this next 
video. Thanks.